yes. Yeah, now it works? Okay. Okay, so we decided to try to start on time after lunch. I know some people are slow to do that. It's a little too slow. Uh, let me remind you once again that I'll do a second CFT lecture today. If you're interested, stick around until 4. But right now, let's start with the lecture of Sergei Falov, who is from the University of Pittsburgh. And we'll talk about Maharana Nanowires. Thank you. Okay, so uh, before I begin, I want to do a quick uh, quiz with you guys. Uh, please all participate. So the rules are like this. If you agree with my statement, raise your hand and keep it up, right? Keep it up until I say something you disagree with. Then it's like a, like a register, right? Like, a, like we write in a CMOS memory, right? One and then something that wrong comes in like zero. Like I say, I'm tall. And then I say I'm short, okay. But if I'm sa I say I'm uh, I don't know. Anyways, you got the point, right? <laughs> so, <coughs> so please all participate. It's a, it's a, just a, a few quick questions. So, um, quantum hole effect was demonstrated. Integer quantum hole effect was demonstrated. Fractional quantum hole effect was demonstrated. Spin hole effect was demonstrated. Graphene can be generated with duct tape. <laughs> I'm a theorist. <laughs> Graphene can be generated with scotch tape. OK, so duct tape, scotch, OK. <laughs> All right. Um, five halves plateau represents a non-abelian particle. <laughs> OK, good. All right. All right, uh, Majorana fermions were demonstrated. Okay. All right, very good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so um, I really cared only about one of these questions, <laughs> right? so, which was I'm a theorist. So this talk will be by an experimentalist and it will not cater to theorists in an obvious way. It will cater to you in a very important way I will try to convey to you how we think and what we know and what we don't know and what things we care about in the experimental sub-universe. And uh, I'm going to use this Majorana fermions as a, as a storyline to tell you about this and to hopefully you know, teach you what I know about how experimentalists think. And this is a great opportunity because this is a, you know, this is a piece of physics that is kind of um, unfolding in front of our eyes and it's wonderful to be part of this process. There are twists and turns which I will introduce to you. I will show you data as recent as maybe a week ago and uh, I will invite you to think about it with me and uh, maybe together we will come up with a, with a proper answer to one of those other questions like has my Rana fermions been demonstrated. So uh, two lectures and the first lecture will largely follow uh, this experiment. Uh, from Delft from a few years ago. So it's based on a semiconductor nanowire with a bunch of nanotechnology around it, but the, mo the most important thing is a cyan piece, which is a superconductor in contact with a semiconductor nanowire. And that's how we uh, decided to implement a Kitaev uh, chain toy model. Uh, fun fact, uh, in case you didn't know it, if you <laughs> have a copy of the science magazine uh, handy somewhere, uh, and if you zoom into this corner, you will see a face of Ethere Majorana on the tip of the nanowire. You see it? Okay. So uh, we snuck it in by the <laughs> editors of science, and they were they were okay with it. They had not, they couldn't do anything about it because <laughs> it was already published. Anyways. So uh, I will start with uh, a little bit of theory, wh which is, uh, you know, very basic theory. But I want to sort of go through this um, to define the piece of physics that we will explore experimentally. OK, so all the nuance will be on the experimental side. The physics will be relatively simple compared to what you are exposed to uh, in this summer school. So uh, there is the Kitaev chain, and I believe you got a very good introduction to that uh, last week. And now uh, there were these uh, two papers, and I'm skipping uh, many, many important works if I start from these two papers. But these two papers in particular 
uh, proposed that you can map Kitaev chain onto a combination of materials that actually exist, okay? Not um, spinless P wave superconductors, which don't exist, or even P wave superconductors, period, which may or may not exist. There is a controversial evidence, there is a lot of evidence that they might exist. Um, onto something that is just these four ingredients one dimensional wire, that's a nanowire, uh, spin orbit interaction, so we can also start with you know, dissecting this uh, very basic Hamiltonian. So one dimensional uh, structure is just this dispersion relation, which is a parabola. And then spin orbit interaction um, is this term which couples momentum to spin, right? So spin and momentum are coupled, and there we have, we know plenty of semiconductors, this is the case, gallium arsenide, although spin orbit is a little weak there. Um, Zeeman effect and superconductivity. In our case, it's induced superconductivity, so induced by proximity. And uh, if you, anybody had a chance to look up the homework that I posted, um, well, if you need some background on the proximity effect, go and do the, uh, those problems and they will teach you about what you need to know for this lecture for the, for the proximity effect. So there's some induced correlation between spin up and spin down and left movers and right movers in a nanowire by proximity to a piece of S-wave superconductor. Okay, so who can tell me what these tau Zs are? What do they represent in this Hamiltonian? Exactly. So it's particle hole symmetry terms, right? So the, the, the entire space of sigmas is doubled and you have this Nambu representation. Okay, so basically uh, what this uh, paper said is that if you create such a system and you uh, put in this Hamiltonian and you set the parameters just right, meaning the field, magnetic field, the superconductivity, the spin orbit term, the chemical potential, importantly for this lecture, then the Majorana fermions, which are these uh, gamma operators, uh, which are their own antiparticles, will pop up at the ends of the system. So it's a finite system. It can be long, but it's finite. And at the ends, there will be two unpaired Majorana fermions, just like Kitayev predicted. Um, so the first part of the lecture, I will show you that there are solid grounds to look for Majoranas uh, following this recipe because all the ingredients are good, right? So you. You're a cook, you go and you find the recipe ingredients for something you want to cook. You want to make sure you get the best ingredients to, you know, because that's the prerequisite to uh, cooking a great dish. And uh, that's what we're going to start with um, today. Uh, first, let's explore a little bit this Hamiltonian um, using these uh, uh, plots, which basically plot out what happens um, in this one dimensional system. So the upper left one. Uh, the one over here, where is the pen? Okay. Ah, here. The one over here, that's just the um, Hamiltonian with spin orbit set to zero and magnetic field set to zero. Okay. So then uh, in this column, if we shift over, we make spin orbit non zero. Okay, so if we go from A to B, that's what spin orbit does. So it lifts spin degeneracy everywhere, except for k equals zero, because sigma cross k term equal to zero, spin orbit is equal to zero, so spin, spin degeneracy is not lifted only at one point. Now for realizing an effectively spinless superconductor, we're gonna need a fully gapped, a fully lifted spin degeneracy, and we achieve that over here. We, we make magnetic field non-zero, so you know the number of zeros decreases, so only chemical potential is zero in this column. Uh, and um, this gap opens also around k equals zero, and that is equal to Zeeman splitting. That gap is equal to Zeeman splitting. So now, um, does this gap open for any arbitrary applied magnetic field? Yes or no? Yes. No. Okay, so uh, what if a uh, spin orbit field is collinear with Zeeman splitting? Right? In that case, this gap will not open, right? So um, 
Spin orbit uh, interaction can be thought of as some effective magnetic field that electrons in a nanowire feel. I will show you a bit more experimental details on this. But uh, basically, uh, you can think of certain direction. Actually, it's perpendicular to the wire. Uh, and if you align an external field with that direction, and both fields quantize spin in the same direction. Okay? So what happens then is uh, Zeeman field cannot rotate spin from spin orbit left to spin orbit right, or spin orbit up to spin orbit down, or Kramer's up down. Um, but it, it will just shift the two parabolas like this. So one, the left parabola will be higher than the, the right parabola by Zeeman splitting. Okay, if we go down by one row now, that's when we add this Nambu formalism. And uh, I'm only plotting the energies greater than zero here, obviously. But there is uh, basically what you have to do for this Nambu formalism. So particle hole symmetric spectrum. Uh, everything that's below zero energy, you reflect it up. Okay? So the, the entire spectrum gets flipped. And so in the particle hole symmetric spectrum, you get all these parts of the, you get the parabola um, flipped like that. And if you add spin orbit interaction, it looks like this. And if you add the Zeeman splitting, it looks like this. Okay, so there are still these gaps here. And we want a fully uh, gapped system. These gaps are missing. So then we add superconductivity. That opens up gaps everywhere around K, uh, energy equals zero, around the Fermi level. And that gap is equal to delta, which is in this representation an induced superconducting gap. So it gaps all the uh, instances where the spectrum crosses zero. So it was like this, became like this. Um, and uh, including in this case, where we're getting close to the topological region, we have three important gaps here. Gap at k equals zero and gap equal at k equal k Fermi. And so, yeah? Right, so let's go to the, uh, as, um, let's go to this case without Zeeman splitting, right? So there is this crossing. There is a piece of Fermi surface essentially crossing zero. Um, k, at, at crossing at 0 k. So that's going to get gapped by superconductivity, that piece. Well, exactly at 0, um, I don't know, we, we, you know, exactly at 0, I'm not sure, but uh, certainly around this point, you know, take infinit infinitesimally um, large positive momentum, it will couple to the infinitesimally large negative momentum. Small, infinitesimally small, sorry. So, you know, these, these two points will pair up and make a gap. And uh, you can uh, continue applying this logic to this entire region. And then obvious that the point exactly at zero will also gap. Uh, I don't know exactly which wave function would correspond to that exact point uh, in this situation. You know, you tell me. Yeah. So I went from here to here, add superconductivity. Yeah. And if I add magnetic field, I have to go from here to here. So this is the interesting part. So you're, you're now you're hitting on something interesting. So, uh, um, so now we have magnetic field on, and we are applying superconductivity. Right? So this part is already gapped. Right? And it's also gapped here. The magnitude of the gap is different. Actually, also the sign of the gap can be different. Okay? So the way this works, uh, so this is the most important uh, point of these all, all of these plots, is that uh, two effects compete for opening this gap. So this point shows that superconductivity will want to open this gap. And it will want to pair these electrons with spins like this. Now, if we start from there and go here, magnetic field also wants to open the gap in the exact same spot, but it wants to align all the spins in the same direction. That's the, that's the Zeeman effect, right? They all want to align this way. So if we go from here to here, we want to open gap with spins like this. If we go from here to here, we want to open gap with spins like this. Now combine these two directions and go here 
we have two competing gap opening effects. So actually they compete against each other and one of them, if you think that one of them opens the gap, the other one closes that gap. So if you start with superconductivity and then add magnetic field, this gap will start to close until it reaches zero. And that's the topological phase transition. Because if you keep cranking up the magnetic field, the gap will reopen. It will become gap again, except holes will be higher than electrons. So then we need the full NAMBU spectrum here. The holes will basically become higher than electrons. And that's the topological phase transition that leads to the emergence of these two Majorana fermions at the ends. So let me try to illustrate this with these plots. So this is um, the same spectrum, the same Hamiltonian plotted. Um, this is a situation where, let's say, magnetic field is zero. Okay? Um, so we have three gaps, all due to superconductivity, and they are at k equal k Fermi, these two, and at k equals zero, this one. So the gaps at k equal k Fermi, you can see they kind of stay open all the time. So what I'm doing here is I'm increasing magnetic field. Now, this is a critical point where magnetic field is such that this criterion is uh, just with the equality sign here. So Zeeman energy is equal to delta. If mu is equal to zero, then Zeeman energy is just equal to delta. So this is the critical point where the central gap at k equals zero is gone. So it was there at zero field, and then it's gone. Now, these gaps st still stay open. Why is that? You can tell me. So they are, spin orbit protects these gaps. That's right. So spin orbit can be thought of as a large magnetic field. And it's the larger, the larger the momentum. So at k, k Fermi, momentum is large. So spin orbit field, which is proportional to k Fermi, is large. And Zeeman effect, the real magnetic field, cannot overcome that field and align all the spins in the same direction and destroy superconductivity. So spin orbit protects these gaps. And so we're not going to be worried about them for most of this lecture. Okay? We have to go to very large fields before these start to close. But we're going to be concerned with this gap at k equals 0. So now I keep increasing magnetic field, and this gap is again here. How do I know that this is not the same plot as here? because these outer parabolas moved farther apart. Yeah? So there's Zeeman splitting. They keep Zeeman splitting. These inner wiggles look very similar between here and here. The outer parabolas are farther apart. And actually, these, these are supposed to close a little bit, if you look closely. OK, so this defines maybe my only formula in this lecture or close to that. So that's the topological condition. If Ez is greater than this square root, then we are in a topological phase. And this corresponds to this situation with two Majorana zero modes localized at the ends of the system. If we are easy, easy less than this square root, we are in that situation. We have a fully gapped system. And that single fermion that is shared by the two Majoranas, right? We, we know that Majoranas can share a single fermi fermion, even though there are two of them, right? I don't have to introduce that, hopefully. Uh, so that fermion is absorbed into the band, into the elect uh, electron and hole bands, OK? And then there is a critical point where there is a single Majorana zero mode propagating through the entire gapless system, and that's this mode, and this is the precisely the Dirac cone. This is a linear dispersion re relation that occurs just at that one point uh, in the parameter space. All right. So now let's um, leave that behind. OK, that was my piece of theory. Uh, now I'm going to introduce to you the experiment that I'm going to be talking about for the majority of this two lecture series, right? So maybe at the end, I'll talk about alternative signatures. But um, what uh, the largest body of work so far has been on is this tunneling experiment. And the idea is um, relatively simple. So for the purpose of this slide, let's assume that the conditions to create Majorana fermions have been satisfied. And we have a system here 
which we can call topological superconductor. You can define it either as a superconductor with a negative superconducting gap at k equals zero, or as a superconductor that carries my Arana zero modes at its boundaries. These are my definitions of a topological superconductor. In one dimension, that's, uh, that's pretty good, and I think maybe even holds in higher dimensions as well. So we have created this topological superconductor. Ooh. And so uh, that means there is this Majorana zero mode at the boundary. Now, what is this object? The way I think about this object is like a box. Actually, the, the two Majorana mode is like a box which we can put an electron in and we can take an electron out. Right? And uh, actually, the energy of the box does not change because of this special property of Majoranas that you can add one fermion to a Majorana system and the energy of the system does not change. That's also the foundation for topological quantum computing to do with Majoranas. Um, so uh, this box, you know, you can think of it as a quantum dot or with zero, ener zero charging energy or yeah, think of it ju as a just a box. And now we are going to tunnel electrons into that box. So we are going to have this, this setup here is called a probe. Uh, so uh, it's a piece of metal, think of a Fermi system, and it's represented here by all the states occupied up to the chemical potential of the probe, EV, and V is the actual voltage we apply to this, to this piece of metal. And this side is grounded, so it's at zero potential. Um, and now because the energy of the system does not change if we add one particle to it, if I tunnel an electron here, um, I'm going to um, put it somewhere at the Fermi level. So there's zero energy state. Now, why would I see that? Why would I see that I was able to do that? It's due to this process that's called the resonant Andreev reflection. And so Andreev reflection is a process that allows current to flow into the superconductor. Right? And the way it goes is that you come with uh, single particles, quasi-particles, electrons, holes, and you have to go into the superconductor. You see the circuit goes through the superconductor, and you can only flow Cooper pairs into the superconductor. So what you do is your electron goes here, hole comes back, right? So the, the net charge transfer is 2E, and a Cooper pair is formed, and that goes into the superconductor. So by this Andrea reflection, electron comes in, hole comes back. I can extract the charge 2E and put it in a superconductor. Now, if you have a state, a Majorana state, at zero energy, there, electron and hole are the same thing. Right? This is one, uh, another paradox of this uh, system, right? So, electron at zero comes in, reflects into a hole, but that's the same particle. And so, they see exact same tunneling conditions. So, it's like if I um, um, draw this out, it's like tunneling through two barriers. So here is a Majorana. Here's an electron. Here's a hole. And these two barriers are exactly the same, the same height, and it's the same particle. And so this is a well-known, it's a elementary quantum mechanics. It's a resonant tunneling process. And if you have such a resonance where both barriers are exact same height, you have a conductance resonance. And so um, a bunch of clever people, including Patrick Lee's group, and also even before him, have calculated that this should give you a peak in conductance of exactly the height of 2e squared over h, quantized conductance peak. And so this is what's plotted here. Actually, the quantized one is this faint gray feature. So here, let me see, yeah. So this is the quantized conductance peak that's calculated at zero temperature. And actually what we're going to be talking more about this lecture is this um, fat trace, which is at finite temperature. So temperature should destroys this beautiful result that you have quantized conductance. So unlike the quantum hole effect, which is very robust, this quantized conductance zero bias peak is not robust to trivial things like temperature. And for the record, all experiments are done at finite temperature. Okay. Hope we all appreciate that. Okay. Um, 
All right, so um, nevertheless, even this little um, dimple of a peak, we can still detect, yeah? What would you look better? Uh, this simulation. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, so this is not an experimental data because there's not a single number. Um, well, I guess there are some numbers here. Um, yeah, so this is just a simulation. Yeah. So the, you take the zero temperature result and you convolute it with a, a broadened Fermi distribution here. You can get um, pretty easily the finite temperature results. It's not very rigorous, but that's enough. Okay, so um, let me tell you a little bit about how we uh, uh, build this experiment. So um, there is a semiconductor nanowire, which I will introduce. There is a piece of S-wave superconductor, and um, this is a remote electrode, which is a, called a gate. And by setting a voltage on this gate, we can change the chemical potential here to tune us hopefully into the topological condition. Here's another gate. It serves a very different purpose. We make it very negative, so we deplete this area of the nanowire of electrons completely, and we separate the left nanowire from the right nanowire, and therefore we create a tunneling barrier. And so now the, the probe side with a normal contact here, the Fermi uh, C is separated from this topological region. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so like I said, for this slide, let's assume that all the conditions were satisfied, but th this whole thing will go into a big magnet, which I will hopefully show you in a, in a couple of slides. And the magnetic field can be oriented in any direction. We have these vector magnets with several coils, and by energizing these coils, we can produce a, a field in arbitrary direction. Okay. Uh, let's get our hands uh, a little more dirty. So uh, back in, I don't know, 2010, I guess, when those papers came out, uh, I was working in Delft in this lab where we were working with nanowires. But we decided to try to implement this proposal. We were facing a, a challenge. Which nanowire, which superconductor should we pick? Okay, And so I think it's instructive to go through this uh, with you guys. So you can imagine that you want... Um, 1D transport, and this is not uh, automatic with any nanowire. If you imagine it's a piece of semiconductor, very narrow, nanometers in diameter, pretty long. If it's dirty, if it has many defects or a dirty surface, then there will be a lot of mixing between the different one-dimensional bands. Or if you just tune it to just having one band, it will easily localize. So you will not by default have a one-dimensional system. So that's something to you know, seek out. Um, you, as a no-brainer, you want strong spin-orbit interaction, right? That's one of the ingredients in the recipe. Uh, maybe less obvious is that you would prefer to have a large G factor, so G mu B, so large Zeeman splitting, for a small field. Why is that? Yeah, but we have pretty large magnets. We have a 10 Tesla magnet and we work with at 100 millitesla here. We don't, want to destroy. we don't want to perturb or destroy superconductivity, right? So magnetic field destroys superconductivity. And so, uh, you know, we discussed with a lot of wonderful theorists when we were conceiving these experiments and, and up to this date, and the picture of a superconducting gap they have in their head is this, uh, is this gray line. But as soon as you start applying field, superconductivity starts to soften more and more, and, and the gap starts to close. So you have a finite window to work with. But if they tell us that magnetic field is the ingredient in the recipe for the Kitayev chain, we have to compromise between those two effects. So why does superconductivity get destroyed by field? That's very easy, right? It's, I already told you, it's S-wave pairing and we are trying to apply field, right? And this is also why we need spin orbit, right? So spin orbit makes the, the spins a little bit uh, kinked, right? They're not a good quantum number anymore. And so it allows S wave to still couple to this new wave function, even in the presence of Zeeman field. Okay, 
So what about a superconductor? Well, we figured we need a, the one with large gap so that we have a lot of space to work with, um, which may have been a mistake looking, looking back. Actually, I will show you some data and we'll think about it together. But that's what we thought at the time. And it sounds reasonable, right? You want a superconductor, you want to take the, the strong one. Uh, we obviously needed to withstand high fields. Uh, and, okay, this is a technical point, but, um, you know, we are going from a semiconductor with Fermi energy of millivolts to a metal with a, you know, 10 times, 10,000 times larger uh, Fermi energy, much larger Fermi energy. There could be some mismatch going from one to the other. Turned out to be not a problem. It's easy to make contact from the semiconductor to the superconductor. Okay, so here are uh, some of the conventional choices. So we had these nanowires and we had maybe these nanowires. And the difference here is uh, spin-orbit interaction is similar. Um, this one comes with very large g-factor. So g-factor is 50. Right? Free electron is 2. Gallium arsenide is 0.4. Point 0.4, right? It's less than a free electron. So you have to go to very large fields to induce Zeeman splitting. Uh, this one is 50, so 100 times larger than gallium arsenide. Uh, spin orbit length is about 100 nanometers. That's a useful number to keep in mind, right? Um, you may ask yourself, what defines the size of the Majorana? Well, there is not a single parameter in the, in the, in the Hamiltonian that I put you that does that. It's a combination. So you can just invert the topological gap and you'll get the size of Majorana. But the ingredients in that are the spin orbit length, the proximity uh, length, uh, coherence length, it's called, uh, the mean free path, so disorder, um, and so on. So it's a convolution of several parameters and it's maybe the, the smallest of them uh, is the Majorana length. Okay, so uh, disorder, in these nanowires was high, so you would uh, you would uh, try to make uh, these uh, one-dimensional subbands appear, and they wouldn't just manifest themselves. So that's because this material uh, has an interesting uh, feature that it's called Fermi-level pinning. So electrons prefer to be on the surface. So if you take a cross section of this wire uh, like that then the density will be like this. So electrons will pile up on, on, the, uh, on the surface of the wire. Um, and um, surface is the most disordered part. So surface is, you know, the wire grows like this and then we handle it in our lab, do a lot of chemistry with it, surface gets really dirty. And so you put the wave function of the electrons in contact with a very dirty surface. And so that's maybe the reason why uh, they were disordered uh, hard to tell. These appear to be cleaner. Okay, so we decided to do to do it with these wires. A couple of reasons for that. Now the c the c superconductors. So let's take two and one. Let's call aluminum. And this one uh, is a special alloy, but in essentially it's niobium. Okay, so aluminum and niobium, two very common S wave superconductors. Now here is the difference between them. Aluminum. Gap is 0.1 milli electron volt. Okay. Niobium gap is several milli electron volt. Large gap, that's what we wanted, right? Same with critical field. Critical field is very, very large, many Tesla. Here, critical field is very, very small. And these are very approximate numbers for bulk, bulk crystals, right? So for thin films, story can be more complicated. This is for bulk. So we decided to go with this one and with this one. Okay, now let's get even more dirty. Uh, this is the machine that grows nanowires, okay? Very important machine, and it stands for Metal Organic Vapor Phase Epitaxy Machine. It's a type of CVD technique. Uh, and this, uh, this enclosure and those pipes that go out there is because there are some poisonous, very, very poisonous gases there, like arsene, it's a little bottle that can take out the whole city of Boulder if it leaks. So there is some safety involved here. Uh, and you manipulate things inside that machine by putting your hands through these 
uh, rubber things. It's a glove box. You stick your hands in and you, you stand on the outside and the processing happens inside. And what this machine does is it flows various gases through a chamber that can be f kept at a fixed temperature. So these are the different controllers for the gases that's in the back of the machine. That's all these poisonous gases that we're going to need. And uh, this is the reactor cell. So we put a, a little substrate in there. And there is a heater and uh, a bunch of pipes and this glass tube. And what we are after is indium antimonide, right? Indium antimonide semiconductor. So we're going to grow that. So how we grow that is like this. So there is a substrate, which is uh, actually indium phosphite. So let me try to write that here, since I brought this fancy iPad here. So that's indium phosphide. And then uh, we spray this substrate with these gold particles. So uh, this gold particle initially is sitting here at the bottom. And then we begin to, well, we keep the temperature where, it, where we want it, about 400 degrees, uh, depending on the recipe. And then we flow these different gases in. So we need indium and we need antimony. So we flow uh, trimethyl indium and we flow something like that also with antimony. So actually my, my knowledge here is also limited because I don't do this. I have collaborators who grow these beautiful wires. But there are, um, I think it's another precursor with um, with antimony. Anyways, let's put it like this. So uh, these organics, in this case, decompose. And uh, they decompose at this surface of this gold particle. The gold particle melts and becomes um, like a blob of liquid. And atoms of indium uh, go inside to saturate this particle. And then they meet with antimony and precipitate below the particle to grow this perfect column of the crystal. And you can grow perfect defect-free microns long crystals. And the diameter is defined by this uh, particle size. And so we can choose what that's going to be. Uh, and this is absolutely criti critical. So without this, there is no Majoranas. There's not even a hope of them. And there are no other things related to nanowires. And so there is a lot of intricate chemistry, growth dynamics to be studied here. And that's, a, as, and, and that's a huge field of science uh, to grow these nanowires. Okay, so these are some of the things that they consider when they grow them. And models only partially cover what happens when these nanowires grow. Okay, now I have to turn it off. And so here's the result. So this is a forest of indium antimony nanowires uh, that was grown. Um, and um, this forest uh, is... Um, 100 nanometer in diameter and a few microns in length. And these are all the reasons why we chose these wires that I already covered with you. Now, we also need very low temperatures. So basically, uh, these, I showed you that the zero bias peak gets shorter and shorter, the higher the temperature. So we need to reach the lowest temperature possible. So we use this equipment, which is a dilution refrigerator. Uh, now, this works by circulating a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4 in a loop. For the rest, it's just like your fridge in the kitchen. Okay, so the coolant is this mixture. And uh, funny enough, below a certain temperature, there is a helium-3 rich phase, which is on top. And there is a helium-4 rich phase, which is on bottom. And these helium-3 atoms evaporate into helium-4. And that produces this cooling that takes us to the millikelvin regime. Okay, and so this is the machine, and the various plates go down in temperature. So this one can be 50 Kelvin, this can be 3 Kelvin, this can be 1 Kelvin, this can be 100 millikelvin, and this plate is a mixing chamber plate. That's where the mixing chamber is, and we mount our sample here, and then the magnet coil, I'm sorry, I don't have it in the picture, I thought I did, but it goes right here. So the magnet goes right here, and so the sample has to sit on a stick which is called the cold finger because of its finger shape. Sample sits in the center of the magnet. Okay. Now, uh, the temperature of 
the fridge is millikelvin, uh, but the temperature of electrons that we tunnel through the Majorana width is not millikelvin because they just shoot from room temperature very fast through copper wires and they don't get cooled. So there is electron temperature and that's different from the fridge temperature. So if you talk to an experimentalist who does these kind of transport measurements, you should ask them what is your electron temperature, not just what is your temperature. Because right? you ask him what is your temperature, he'll tell you 5 millikelvin. You put it in your simulation and it's wrong. It looks too good. Okay, so for our fridges, the fridge temperature can be millikelvin, but the electron temperature can be 50 millikelvin, 100 millikelvin. So it sort of gets tricky if you want to bring it down to, let's say, 30. And so you do that by a bunch of filters. So from the electrical point of view, temperature is like noise. So you can just characterize with Johnson noise, right, KBT. Uh, and so the way you cool it down is you put a bunch of RC filters and other filters that consequently go from room temperature to lower and lower temperature until they reach your device. Um, and uh, basically you can think of it as you slow down electrons at different stages in the cryostat and they have time to exchange their energy with the lattice and cool down the distribution of electrons. Okay. Now uh, this is how we make our devices. So another big part of it is nanofabrication. Uh, and nanofabrication goes like this. So in this case, uh, we prefabricated a huge array of gates. Each of these blobs here has five electrodes that are already on the substrate. Um, and then we covered them with dielectric. So this black spot is dielectric. And that's because we're going to put wires on top of them, but we don't want the two be, to be in electrical contact. So there is a layer of dielectric. So that is two steps of nanofabrication, which involve uh, lithography, writing this pattern that you designed, and then metallizing it or putting dielectric or etching. Uh, that's all done in the clean room. And then we put down wires, in this case randomly, but now we have a way to align wires by a very precise method of uh, taking one wire and looking in a microscope and putting it down very carefully with a trained uh, graduate student. Um, so the wire that crosses the gates uh, forms a foundation for a device. And here's a, another picture of that Majorana device from Delft where the wire is now sitting at, on the gates. You can see the gates. This is the dielectric. So for example, one of these gates can be used to make a tunnel barrier between this probe and this superconductor. So that will become the tunneling probe. <coughs> Majoranas will be generated here. Um, you can see that superconductor covers the wire, but only partially. That's to allow coupling of these gates electrostatically. So if there was metal everywhere, there would be no electrostatic coupling between the semiconductor and the gate. So the electrostatic calculations are part of this process to optimize these things. Um, yeah, so that's the device. Okay. Now these gates are uh, great um, things and um, for example a lot of the some of the criticism of this experiment was uh, I think maybe misguided because people said well you just tunneling uh, to the edge you're just tunneling to where this star is and so you don't really know whether the wave function that you detect, the state that you detect, really lives at the edge or whether it lives somewhere else in the system, right? So you, you have a stationary probe, but for example, with STM, you could go everywhere and check where the zero bias peak occurs, at the end of the wire or somewhere else. Well, you, we can kind of do that. So here are a couple of examples where we sweep different gates. So BG1, locate BG1, that's that wide gate, the big gate. And here's BG3, right? So that's BG3 is halfway down underneath the superconductor. And we're looking at the same state here. So for example, this state, BG1, crosses zero bias, but it disperses very fast as we change BG1, doesn't stay at zero bias. And here is the same state with BG3. So you can conclude that BG3 doesn't couple to this state, meaning that the state lives more under BG1 than under BG3, right? So gates provide us a spatial orientation as well. On the other hand, there are these faint other lines 
They are less visible, but they are tuned with BG3. So why are they less visible? That's because they're farther away from the uh, probe, right? So probe is this, this one here, that's the gold, and this is the superconductor. And so states under BG3 are far away from this area, so they give faint transport resonances, but they do tune with BG3. So it's all consistent. And it's not a full ability to map space, but it gives us some feeling for where things live. Okay. Now to the Majorana recipe. So my goal of today was to convince you that we have good ingredients. So here's how we do it. We observe these quantized conductance steps. So we take one of these gates in between N and S, and we sweep that gate, and as we sweep that gate, we go through plateaus. The first plateau is especially obvious, and also here in color scale, uh, this color is this 1, which is close to 1 e squared over h, and you know that each one-dimensional subband gives you 2 e squared over h of um, conductance. Sorry, it's 1 times 2 e squared over h, so we are at zero field. And as you apply magnetic field, this color emerges, which is very close to 0.5, because we spin polarize, and so now we have 0.5 times 2 times e squared over h, so 1 times e squared over h. Um, you can also convince yourself that these are really subbands by doing these kind of plots where you sweep gate versus source drain bias, right? So you apply voltage across these two, that's the source drain bias, and the gate potential is on this axis, and the source drain bias is on the vertical axis. And these um, transitions between plateaus, the plateau edges disperse in this linear fashion, which is a telltale sign that these are really uh, one-dimensional subbands. By the way, here is a superconducting gap. But we're going to come back to that uh, later. OK, so we have some evidence that in this nanowire, we have plateaus, and um, you may not be very impressed with that, because maybe you have seen this plot. This is also from Delft, but from uh, 25 years ago. This is the first demonstration of quantized conductance, uh, but not in a nanowire. This was done in a two-dimensional electron gas, and uh, this also explains why these plateaus are so beautiful, and for our nanowire plateaus, we had to get all this additional evidence, like look at uh, source drain bias versus gate dependencies, go to magnetic field, and so on. The reason is simple. So um, the way this sample looked was a couple of gates on top of a 2D plane of electrons, 2D electron gas, and these gates are depleted, so there are no electrons inside these shapes. There are no electrons here, no electrons here. Electrons can only pass through this narrow path. And so when one electron passes through, even if there are some defects, that it bounces off, it has a very little chance of bouncing back into the constriction because the defects are not so frequent and there is this entire 2D phase space to reflect into and go away. And this is what gives this robust conductance quantization or robust looking. In fact, it's not robust. It's not robust to backscattering. So when we have a nanowire, then any little defect has a very high chance of leading to backscattering. And that's why our plateaus are not robust. And that's why it's so impressive to even see such a strong hint of them, even if they don't look so regular and so beautiful like in two-dimensional electron systems. Yeah? So I missed the point when you showed this uh, uh, what is it, the first problem. It starts with zero and then we still have a So what is the reason? So usually, um, so are you asking why we only see the first one and then we don't really? Uh, I mean the plateau value, so first is like two and then another three and four. Well, it, actually the first one is one, the second one is supposed to be two, but we don't resolve it in this sample. So maybe if your question is in general about uh, 1D systems, then you should look at this plot. So here they are, um, you know, one, two, three, four, uh, but this is e squared over pi h bar, which is the same as two e squared over h, right? So this is a zero field 
plot. And so the reason for this is that there is a perfect cancellation between density of states and uh, velocity. So you take the product of the two and you get this number. And when you calculate current through this system, you have to multiply the two things. And so current turns out to be just the number of subbands times 2 squared over h, you know, divided by voltage, or times voltage bias, sorry. Yeah, so, so this is a one-dimensional conductance quantization, and you can count the number of steps, and it will tell you the number of one-dimensional subbands in your system, or in your constriction. OK, so then um, already that plot to told you that we can have one subband, but we can also have two, maybe three subbands. And so uh, this is a generalization of the topological condition for a multi-subband system. It's actually very simple. Um, so you recognize that formula that's easy, delta plus mu squared square root, uh, except now I put some indices here to make it more experimental. So instead of easy, I put g mu b b theta, so that would mean that we can also rotate this angle. Um, and then mu as a function of x, that's because I have these gates and I can change mu spatially. I can make mu here to be 1 and mu here to be something else. Uh, and now delta has the, that's the, we're looking at k equals 0 delta, and the index n corresponds to which subband we're talking about. So in general, each subband can have a different value of induced gap. Um, but I think for this simulation, they assume the same. And basically what they show here is that uh, we have to apply this condition um, starting with mu equals 0 at the bottom of each subband. So if we have several subbands in a system like this, then we're going to first put mu equals 0 here, we put mu equals 0 here, mu equals 0 here, and out of each of these starting points, we're going to have a topological phase growing like this, following that formula with a rounded bottom. And so blue here represents a topological region. Now, what happens here? Why does it become white again? So you have one subband here, another subband here. They are dispersing in magnetic field. Uh, and they reach this point, and it becomes white again, which means non-topological. That could be, but I have no precise clue what that is. <laughs> but so, so here, the, the, the physics is very simple. Um, in magnetic field, these subbands start to split, right? So in magnetic field, I have to draw something like this. And the other subband, change the color, will split like this. And so when blue and red cross each other, we start getting the wrong number of crossings at the Fermi level. Okay. And so we go out of the topological phase. So what you need to do is just to count the number of bands below the Fermi level that you set. And that number changes when the bands cross. And that's why you go through this checkerboard of color and no color. So this color is again. Uh, topological phase, and this color is again topological phase. Now, experimentally, we don't have access to such a huge space. Uh, in the initial Delft experiment, which I'm talking about mostly today, we, we didn't know the number n, but we knew that we couldn't change n, and we could not change the chemical potential by much. So we were lo localized sort of around around one of these crossings. And as far as magnetic field, this is 20, 40, 60 times the spin orbit energy. We could only go to here. Okay, So we were stuck somewhere, somewhere there. And since then, we have expanded at least this range, if not this range. OK. Um, well, it's just the chemical potential. So think about uh, the cross-section of the wire as a, as a um, you know, constraint on your wave function. And so you have uh, quantization 
in uh, this xy in the transverse direction. Think of it as a particle in a, in a spherical box. Actually, nanowire cross-section is a hexagon. Okay? So in a hexagonal box, you have a wave function that is quantized. And along the wire, it's, uh, it's a, you know, a free system, a propagating wave. Right? But in two dimensions, it's quantized. And so these quantized levels are what give the origin of this. And this parabola is a dispersion in the third dimension in, along the wire. Okay, so it's as simple as that. OK, spin orbit interaction. Um, we've done some experiments to actually measure spin orbit interaction in the system. And that, that was done with um, localized electrons. So we made traps for electrons, actually quantum dots, by gates. We made very tight potentials, and we trapped exactly two electrons, and we studied their spin states. So what are the possibilities if you trap two electrons in two nearby traps? Is that they form uh, sorry, singlet states and triplet states. And um, if the two electrons are in two separate traps, um, both states are allowed. You can have them both pointing like this, like this. There is not much energy difference between these configurations. But if you try to put two electrons on top of each other in the same box, then it's energetically hugely favorable to put them in a singlet state than in a triplet state, which would involve a higher orbital due to Pauli principle, right? You cannot put two on the same orbital. So you have to go higher up. And that's the uh, uh, reason to have spin blockade. And that's why we have spin qubits and so on. And so we mapped out this situation because when you um, try to do transport through such a two-dot system, then uh, as soon as a triplet state is formed like this, it cannot cross over because it c costs too much energy to have a triplet on the same dot. So this electron comes here. It's a triplet. It cannot go out because this spin is the same as this. And this energy level is maybe too high. So that's a spin blockade. Uh, but spin orbit interaction can lift that blockade because spins are not very well defined. And so um, basically it allows you to see current, for example, at these resonances, even when it's not supposed to be there. So here we see transport from a triplet state to a singlet state. And as we change magnetic field, the position of triplet state changes. And so this resonance shifts in energy. And here is a triplet state to a triplet state, but going from 1, 1, which is two electrons like this, to 0, 2, which is two electrons together. So all of this becomes possible with spin orbit interaction. However, when triplet, when singlet O2 and triplet O2, so singlet like this and triplet like this on the same dot become the same in energy at some field, they anticross. And they anticross because of spin orbit interaction. And so we, we measured this anticrossing to be a, a few hundred millivolts. And from that, we could extract the spin orbit length, which I told you was 100. But we measured it to be more like 200, so pretty close, but not quite the same. So by doing quantum dot measurements and measuring spectroscopy of singlet and triplet states in quantum dots. And what's more, we plotted this gap between tri triplet and singlet states as a function of angle of magnetic field. And we found that when magnetic field was perpendicular to this nanowire, the gap closed. And when a gap closes, it means that spin orbit field is in the same direction as the field that we apply, by the same logic as I told you in the beginning, right? That EZ gap cannot be opened between singlet and triplet if spin orbit and B are in the same direction. So we mapped out the size of this gap, and we found that at 90 degrees, it's zero or minimal. And from this, we learned that spin orbit is pointing perpendicular to the nanowire, which also tells you that it's a Rajba-type spin orbit interaction. Okay. So th we had this measurement, and we had a pretty good idea that spin orbit is this way. And that means that we have to apply magnetic field in some other direction, for example, like this or like this, in order to see Majoranas. If we apply it this way, we should not see Majoranas. OK, so this is the, the data that sort of um, is 
the first signature or that we thought we have Majorana fermions. And this is a sequence of plots from zero to about half a Tesla, measured in a device that I already showed you a couple of times. So let's look at the lowest plot, at the lowest plot. And the, by the way, they are offset by hand, by, just so that we can see them all. So look at the lowest plot. We have a minimum at zero, and we have these characteristic ears. And you recognize already from my simulation that I showed you, this is the induced superconducting gap in a nanowire. So these uh, ears are called quasi-particle peaks or BCS peaks, and they are you know, very common in all kinds of superconducting measurements. So if you see them, you have a pretty good idea that you've induced superconductivity um, in your device. Um, now, these peaks are at about uh, 250 microvolts, and the gap of niobium, I told you, is some millivolts. So it's a factor of 5 to 10 off. It should be somewhere here. Uh, so that also tells you that this is the induced gap. So the gap that we induced in a nanowire is much less than the gap of the superconductor itself. Okay, so then we uh, turn on the field by 10 millitesla. And at around 100 millitesla, we start seeing this little bump, zero bias conductance peak. And this bump, interestingly, it, it persists and it sticks to zero bias. It even grows for about half a tesla. Uh, and this zero bias conductance peak is what we studied as a signature of Majorana fermions, uh, you know, that was four year or five years, four or five years ago. Okay. So let's uh, study this feature. Um, because if you just see zero bias peak, that's not enough. And there are many things that give zero bias peaks. So let's un try to understand what this is. So let's start with temperature dependence. The first thing, you do the same experiment. You raise the temperature slowly. And this is the lowest temperature, which was the electron temperature in the dilution refrigerator and was 60 millikelvin, 60. Okay. Now the fridge itself was maybe at 20 or 30, but the electrons were at 60. Uh, and this is warming it up all the way to maybe 400 millikelvin. So by 400, this feature is gone. So what happens to it is just, it just smears. It broadens and the peak goes down. So essentially you can say that you know, the area is constant and the temperature makes it wider. And so the height goes down. And so by by half, a, by half a Kelvin, you cannot resolve this peak anymore. It's gone. And it's kind of consistent with this. Uh, with this. And also tells you that you know, 2 e squared over h may be an unattainable signature of Majorana fermions. Right? If, you, if you tell me that you only believe Majorana fermions, if I show you a 2 e squared over h peak, I'm going to tell you, sorry, it's not possible. Right? So in the simulation, they only consider Yes, between this very faint gray line and this is just a thermal broadening. Yeah. And you know, you can introduce thermal broadening in many different ways. And I think this was one of the most primitive ways, just broaden the lead. Yeah. Right, if you wait for some time, it will equilibrate, except you're measuring current. And current is, um, well, it's, well, this is in conductance, but uh, I can tell you current is picoamps, nanoamps, depending on the settings. So we can calculate nanoamp, well, let's say I can tell you that 160 femtoamps is one electron crossing the system per microsecond. Right, and you know, the picoamp is uh, you know, five electrons crossing the system per microsecond. Nanoamp is 5,000 per microsecond. So electrons don't spend that much time. If we want to, you know, we also need to measure them. So we need some sizable current. And so they don't, they don't have an opportunity to spend much time in the system. So what you can do is essentially make their path longer. So they go at large speed, like cars on the highway, but you send them through the entire state of Colorado, right, and through the mountains, and, and they, they come out of gas. They come back to Boulder out of gas. And so that's what we do, essentially. We make them go through lengthy wires and resistors where they bounce back and forth and 
and then I slow down and cool down. Yeah. But th this process is far from perfect. And um, you know, a standard dilution refrigerator would not have a very good electron temperature, and then we have to do some extra special things. It is possible, yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard, but it's, it's been done. Yeah. And uh, this would be a great thing to do for these experiments. But uh, mind you, that will still bring us to maybe 10 millikelvin. And so we will still have a broadened peak, which will not have the 2 squared over h height. OK. So this is um, another thing that was explored back, uh, back then. Um, we had s several gates in this device, like I showed you. And uh, the green one was set to be a tunnel barrier. And for the purposes of this slide, we're tuning this one out here. And so what it shows is that here are the quasi-particle peaks of the induced gap. The one in the center is the zero bias peak. Looks like it's not going anywhere with this gate. However, this gate does tune something, because there are these resonances and also this blob that is affected by this gate. So here it's not there, and here it's there, and you can even see how it disperses. So this is some kind of a state that is not robust with this gate, and this zero bias peak is robust. So you could say that it is two, two things are possible. The zero bias peak is somewhere far away from gate two. That's possible, right? Like I showed you. If it's far away, then it's not sensitive electrostatically to that gate. Or maybe it's a Majorana fermion, and we are, with this gate, just tuning the chemical potential inside the gap. And we're not affecting the fact that Majorana is there or not there. Right? So the Majorana fermions are there as long as gap is inverted. And it's not supposed to go anywhere. It's supposed to stay at zero bias. So there was this robustness that was observed. However, we also found that um, some gate tuning is required, but we could not conclude too much. And this is the reason. So here are a couple of sweeps of the barrier gate, the green gate. And what you can see is a forest of resonances. And even though I tried to convince you that this is a very clean nanowire, there were still these transport resonances that probably come from the fact that electrons are bouncing off of some defects. For example, there is an electron going here, and then it sees something, and maybe it interferes with itself. OK, it doesn't really jump out of the wire. It's a little small for me to draw. But it, it kind of goes back and forth and makes some kind of a standing wave interference resonance. And these just obfuscate what you can see. What you can see, however, is that zero bias feature is in many of these plots. So kind of uh, if you squint and look at around zero bias, you'll see it through many of these resonances. So that tells you that these guys are not really interfering with the fact that zero bias peak is there or not there. So they also go away, and the zero bias peak stays. However, here we managed to make it go away. The zero bias peak is gone. And what we did then is we adjusted this gate number one. Okay, so some gate tuning was required, but it was very difficult to tell what that tuning did, and in particular, you know, to map out this condition. Then this is Z here. For the Zeeman energy to be greater than this is not possible because of all these spurious resonances that were in that device. So this is. Uh, you know, still consistent with Majorana, but this is, was an open question it's for future experiments to, to figure out what this uh, relation, uh, whether this relation really holds or not. Okay. We were able to verify that spin orbit interaction plays a role in this effect, right? So I, we talked a bit spin orbit. Uh, we figured out that spin orbit interaction has this orientation perpendicular to the nanowire and in the plane of the substrate, so along in the same direction as gates. And that's great because now we can rotate our external field and check whether zero pi sp goes away. 
So that's what was done. Um, we kind of crossed out spin orbit interaction by aligning spin orbit field and external field. And so we went from the upper situation from this uh, case here, where the two are perpendicular, to this case here, where the two are parallel. And you can see that the crossing of the bands is now back. And that means that there are no single Majoranas. You can say there are two Majoranas on each end, and they couple and uh, hybridize away from zero. A zero bias peak should go away. And so this is kind of what happens. This is the situation where the two fields are perpendicular. There is this zero bias state inside the gap. Blue is low current, low conductance. Red is high conductance. White is in between. And then align the two fields together, and there is no zero bias peak. So does it prove it's Majorana? Well, uh, maybe not, but at least it, it hints strongly that spin orbit does play a role in the creation of this state. And so this is a more extensive study. Now we fixed magnetic field and rotated it in two different planes. So in this case, we rotated it in the plane uh, where spin orbit field was. And so then you see that there is a zero bias peak around the angle pi and zero and around pi over two, where the two are supposed to be aligned from previous measurements, there is a zero bias dip. And then, interestingly, we rotated it in this plane. So if spin orbit interaction is this way, we rotated it perpendicular. So for all directions, zero bias peak was supposed to survive. And this is what happens. So there is this line persisting for all two pi. So in the 3D, space we mapped out and found this one direction around which spin orbit interaction um, lives and uh, that's where the zero bias peak kind of went away okay we also tried to remove superconductivity uh, but it's actually not possible because we picked such a strong superconductor that its critical temperature is 20 Kelvin, right? And the zero bias peak disappears at half a Kelvin. And also its critical magnetic field is 20 Tesla. And we have to work at 0.1 Tesla, right? So we could not really destroy superconductivity in our device. But so we fabricated the identical device with two gold contacts, no superconductor. So what's the quality of this test? Right, it's fairly indirect, right? It's a different device, different system. And on top of that, we found zero bias peaks there. They just didn't look quite the same. So I refer you to the supplementary information of the science paper to, to look up those zero bias peaks. There's another problem I can tell you about in this. So if you look at this, at how this device looks, what is the other problem that might be uh, with the claim that this checks for Majoranas in the absence of superconductivity or checks for zero bias peaks. What if I tell you that uh, we did not put this in a vector magnet, so field was fixed along the green arrow? Right, so the wire is not aligned very well. And uh, if you look back, you can see that there is actually a fairly narrow window of angles where the zero bias peak is observed. And this is maybe just on the, on the edge there of that window. And th there were actually theory papers following up uh, on, on, that, on that work, which pr you know, also reproduced this, that this envelope should not be very large, that for the most part, there should be no zero bias peak for most angles. And so anyhow, this, we tried this test, and for what's it worth, it was there. OK, remaining time today, I will discuss other zero bias peak mechanisms. Okay? So actually, we are all doing condensed matter, and you can probably name some of these yourself. But um, we were certainly. Um, made aware of these and some others, uh, even if we didn't know about them, like for example, reflectionist tunneling, even though she was observed in Delft um, about a decade or maybe even two decades before my time there, um, 
uh, you know, people reminded us that that exists, essentially a disorder effect where Andreev reflection uh, in a disordered medium gives a zero bias conductance peak. So we could check for that. Anyways, uh, I represent them with these um, pictures because these are Russian cartoon uh, characters that I uh, love. Uh, but uh, I don't want to put data here because all the data is the same. It's a zero bias peak, it's a zero bias peak, it's a zero bias peak. So it would look a, a very boring, this slide. Um, and there are other reasons. For example, you can see Andreev reflection, right? There's a little raccoon reflecting and Majorana, of course, it's, uh, you know, you want to catch her by the tail. You want to find the Majorana. You want your zero bias peak to be the Majorana. Um, Okay, disorder, so the guy kind of disheveled. Um, if you know how Brian Josephson looks, or you can Google his picture, you will understand this one. Uh, uh, actually, no explanation here. And, uh, and this is the unknown effect, sort of, you know, walks like Majorana, talks like Majorana, but not a Majorana, right? It's possible in, the, in my uh, paranoid mind, it's certainly possible. And so this is, uh, this is called Chiburashka. And uh, actually, this is an animal that was shipped to Soviet Union in a crate of oranges. And uh, he stumbled out of the crate. And uh, he didn't know who he was. And they didn't know who he was at the zoo. So he's the unknown effect. OK. So it also helps me to ridicule all these alternative explanations. Makes my job easier. Um, but um, OK, uh, I must say, uh, I cannot rule all of them out. And that will be in the second lecture. But I can rule out some of the most commonly referred to with sort of single liners. right? And condo effect is one of them. So condo effect is, um, you know, you may know about it from you know, the bulk condensed matter. Um, literature where it's uh, you know increase in resistance at low temperature in uh, in quantum dots uh, it's uh, associated with zero bias peak because there is this localized spin in a quantum dot coupled to the C of electrons in the source and drain leads and this coupling induces a resonance conductance resonance at the Fermi energy okay I don't have time to derive it for you if you don't know about it but it's a very common one and the point about that effect is that it goes away in magnetic field. It becomes two peaks that disperse with the Zeeman splitting. And here we have this huge G factor on our side. G factor of 50 means one Tesla is equal to 1.5 milli electron volts. Uh, this really helps us. So uh, nevertheless, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it can give you a fright. For example, these uh, people in Grenoble, uh, um, sort of trolling us by trying to mimic our data with their condo data. So, you know, uh, just don't look at the axis, but look at this. Here is a superconducting gap. Here is a zero bias peak. It, it turns on. It's actually already there at zero if you look closely, but it certainly turns on strongly. Actually, it persists beyond the gap. Gap closes here because this is aluminum. So it closes at a few tens of millitesla. Uh, and this paper is actually about the competition between condo effect and superconductivity because there are two types of coupling that you can have to the leads. One is this condo coupling, one is to make a singlet between the spin on the dot and uh, electrons in the, in the Cooper pair condensate. And these are the, the line cuts, right? You can see the, uh, the zero bias peak coming up. Here, magnetic field goes this way. This is a superconducting gap, and then inside the gap, you have the zero bias peak. Now let's put this effect in uh, perspective. So this is their, the scan from the same group, just taken to a field of three Tesla. Okay? And this is uh, indium arsenide, so the G factor is 10 times less than in, and then in indium antimonide. And the data that I showed you in the previous slide is here. This is, you see the two maxima, this is a superconducting gap. And then it's gone. And then you just have these two broad resonances that Zeeman split. That's a classic condo effect. It splits in two. Now let me plot it um, on the right scale to 
show you how this would look in indium antimonide with a G factor of 50 and superimpose it with the delft data. So this is the gap. So gap is uh, somewhat larger, but not that much larger. So this is their aluminum gap. This is the niobium gap is here. This line is the G factor of 50. So that is long gone. This is where the zero bias peak onsets and it persists. It's actually still here. You cannot see it in the color scale and it persists to one Tesla. So condo effect is long gone. By the way, there is this uh, dramatic feature, which is some kind of state that crosses zero bias, but doesn't stick here, right? So it kind of starts and it crosses with a G factor of approximately 50. So this is some kind of a spinful state of an electron in indium antimonide band structure, which has this characteristic G factor. Uh, and this is in huge contrast with this zero bias feature that we that we studied that one doesn't want to leave zero bias like you would expect from a h state of a topological phase and this is for your reference the g factor 2 for free electron so it even beats that okay so that's uh what we did with the uh, condo effect uh now josephson effect that's the flow of supercurrent so current flows without resistance at zero voltage so zero voltage is zero bias current flows without resistance means it's high conductance and, and, and technically it's infinite conductance right but um, if the Josephson effect is not robust it can look like a zero bias peak I'm going to show you in a moment and in fact um, interesting uh, historic perspective so this was uh, almost a year before the science paper we decided to make a device like this to look for Majoranus. So we were going to uh, make Majoranus um, here. This is a superconductor. And you can see this metal is the same color. That's also niobium. That's also a superconductor. And my idea was we're going to put it far, far away such that any superconductivity induced in a nanowire will not travel all the way there. And electrons here will be effectively like normal electrons because proximity effect has some decay length, some coherence length, and it, it will not propagate all the way there. And there are a couple other works where the two metals are the same, right? and they also reported zero bias peaks. Now, what we found in this device, even the contact spacing is about a micron, which is very large, uh, we observed supercurrent in such device. So this, this color here, these are again current voltage characteristics so this is voltage and current is on this axis so we send current and this color is zero voltage so there is supercurrent even when the contacts are very far apart and this supercurrent persists you can kind of trace these features to very high fields to tesla so it's a kind of very robust remarkably surprisingly unbelievably robust josephson effect in these devices that we did not expect to see and um, here's the thing this is a kind of piece of experimental truth when the supercurrent becomes small this is how it looks so it is no longer a zero voltage state and then a switch into a finite voltage state it's just this little wiggle and there's a zoom out and this is due to thermal fluctuations out of the supercurrent state so this is a well-known effect current voltage rounding but if you take a derivative of this trace this is what you get you get the zero bias peak okay so having two superconductors is a bad idea and we dealt with it by making one of the contacts normal so i could have ended the story by saying one of the contacts is normal there cannot be a josephson effect end of story it is not an explanation but we just played with it in the superconducting device and you can even see here is a region with very small uh, supercurrent at finite field of hundreds of millitesla and this is a current bias scan where we try to pass current and we plot voltage in the scale and this is a voltage bias scan where we apply voltage and measure current and at about this field we start to see a zero bias feature come out of nowhere inside something that looks like a gap and again we we mimicked the Majorana data with this Josephson device just due to having a very, very poor Josephson junction with very, very small uh, supercurrent. Okay, so you have to be careful with that. 
There were some interesting proposals. This is now related to essentially Andreev levels, but um, they called it weak anti-localization. Um, so uh, weak anti-localization is a spin orbit type effect. And uh, we usually associate it with a peak of conductance at zero bias, so zero bias conductance peak, due to canceled interference from spin orbit interaction, right? So yeah, weak localization, which is a zero bias dip in conductance. Weak anti localization is a peak inside that dip because of um, const uh, constructive interference of paths due to spin orbit. So um, in this case, uh, that typically occurs, this constructive interference occurs at zero field. So you can rule out weak anti localization, right? Well, according to this paper, you can't. You can have this kind of zero bias peak that kind of sticks around a little bit. Uh, even at finite field, when some levels in your device come close to zero bias, and then they have a tendency to stick a little bit. And this I cannot explain theoretically, but it has to do with the poles of the Green's function uh, becoming um, imaginary. Uh, so just read this paper, and it's great. Uh, and then when several levels do this in the similar parameter range, you can extend this stickiness to, to make a sort of a an elongated zero bias peak. So I tried to plot uh, the Delft data on the same scale, and I uh, demonstrate here basically that, well, you know, uh, a lot of levels have to do this to um, make this sticky state stick for such a long range. Okay, so that you can make this argument that this is not the same effect just because of the of the scale of it. Now comes data from last week. A uh, very similar device to what I showed you before. And here we were able to kind of reproduce this theory, right? So you can see actually levels from zero magnetic field. Here is the gap, zero field. And these levels start to cross. And there are several of them. There is one, there is two, there is more. And there is a region where they stick um, for a finite range of field. And also in gate space, you can see it's a fairly disordered device. And there are some points where at finite field you have a uh, you have zero bias states that stick around okay so disorder can produce zero bias peaks and this is maybe less understood than other uh, reasons and this is the one that I cannot rule out with a single liner but I you know I can invite you to look at the data and compare it and maybe uh, argue that this is not a disorder effect in all of our devices. So we have to make a special disorder device to see it. OK, coming to a close here for today, uh, summarizing the signatures of Majoranas that were observed in 2012. Okay. Um, so in terms of the zero bias peak appearing, there was also a comforting fact that it happened at around 100 millitesla, which if you convert it with a g factor of 50 is about 150 microelectron volt. And the gap was 250 microelectron volt. So we are not far from this EZ equal delta criterion, uh, but we could not you know, fully map it out. And there is still some small discrepancy. Uh, it's a very narrow peak that sticks to zero bias in field and in gate. And so this robustness of the peak allowed us to distinguish it from things like Kondo effect. Right? Yeah? Yes, you should. And probably I'm going to talk about it tomorrow, because we are out of time today. But yes, you're right. Um, so it w this, un well, I can comment very quickly. So this, this closing of the gap, of the k equals 0 gap, was predicted by theory, was not observed by our experiment. And within a week or two, there were five new theory papers saying, well, actually, you don't need to observe it. it you know, in the exact transport regime that you have actually doesn't, doesn't appear, which is also a word of caution for you guys, right? The 90% of you who raised their hand on the theory question. Um, OK, we verified the role of spin orbit interaction. So for what it's worth, uh, it seems to play a role in creating a, the zero bias peak. Um, and uh, OK, we could rule out some of the things. And now, as a, as a step into tomorrow, this will be the last slide for today. 
and feeds very nicely into the question that was just asked. These are the things that were not observed, and we touched upon a couple of them already, and we're going to talk about the others. So 2e squared over h, zero bias conductance peak was not observed. The peak in the most widely cited graph is actually 5% of that, which is a little bit unfair because if you change the gates around a little bit, you can make it to be 10%, 15%, but it's certainly not 2e squared over h. It's less. And that could be due to temperature. Our peak was clearly temperature broadened by the way it went away. Okay, this closing of the topological gap. So that the um, emergence of the zero bias peak was observed, but the topological phase transition itself was not observed. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Also about finite size effects, where the second Majorana is. Um, that's supposed to cause the zero bias peak to become two peaks as a function of vi various parameters, field, gate, distance, size of the device. There's been some work in this direction since 2012. Um, and by this, I mean the equation that I gave you, Ez greater than square root of delta squared plus mu squared. This equation itself was not demonstrated in 2012. We are trying to demonstrate it now, and I'm going to show you that tomorrow as well. So let me close for today, and uh, see you tomorrow. Right, um, so when I, maybe I should go to that slide. Um, yeah, so uh, this, uh, what we're looking at here is um, a, a sequence of temperature plots. And the question is, well, how high should this be if you put in, um, you know, 50 millikelvin? Uh, well, it, it's, it's not so easy to answer. Um, so first, let me tell you uh, why I think that uh, this is temperature broadened. It's because from the lowest temperature, which is, let's say, 50, 60 millikelvin, it broadens continuously as we raise the temperature a little bit. So as soon as we start heating it up, it already starts to broaden. So this is my uh, very naive argument for why it is broadened by temperature. Right. So if, it, if I would raise it up to here and the peak stayed the same, I would say it's not broadened by temperature, it's broadened by something else. Okay. Uh, now, what, what height should we expect? Um, so um, let me point to, you know, this is what we're going to start tomorrow from, but let me point to this fact. The bottom of this plot is not at zero. It's at some finite conductance. Right, so it's, it's uh, very possible that uh, we have a convolution of two things going on here. So some kind of a um, background like this and um, a, a feature like this, right? So the true height of it is not precisely known because the bottom is elevated. And this is what uh, became known as a soft gap issue. There is some conductance inside the gap even where there should be none, okay? Um, then another, po another point that makes it difficult to predict what the, what the height should be is, has to do with this Majorana oscillation uh, idea. So uh, basically, uh, this zero temperature plot is for an infinite system where the second Majorana is very, very far away. What would it look like for a finite system around zero is there will be, uh, two of these spikes separated by some distance. Now, this distance can still be small and can be within this, this height. But then we're going to be dealing with temperature broadening um, two of these guys. Right? And they're, they're, they're kind of the total area is 2 squared over h. Right? So I guess we could say within a factor of 2 if we had no background. But we did, and so we couldn't say. So that's why I say it's a little complicated. Okay.
what? <laughs> <laughs> so this is proximity induced uh, superconducting So shouldn't you see like two? Uh, we should, yeah. Uh, in some in, in some regimes, we do, yeah. So most of the plots that I showed you focus on the range sort of to half a millivolt. Mm -hmm. But if I showed you the ones that go out, then you would see something like this. And so there is a there is a large gap on the scale of uh, a few millivolts. Then there is one at a half a millivolt, and the Majorana would be would be sitting here. Okay, but so most of the data that I showed today is like this, yeah. But if you look up the special supplementary information to the science paper, there are some plots like this in there. So you observed the it's projection for certain angle yeah. orientation, yes. Right, so that's, um, I'm sorry, that's, um, well, we could go to the, the, this figure, for example, right? So this is about 100 millitesla, and the G factor of 50, one tesla is 1.5 milli electron volt. So 100 millitesla is about 150 micro electron volt. This induced gap, the apparent one that we can see, is 250. So 150 and 250. That's the comparison. Now, right, so now this is our equation. So it's not quite satisfied, but it's experimentally not too far away. And uh, another interesting point to make maybe is that it's a good question to ask wh what, what is this gap, right? I showed you that there are at least three gaps that could manifest, right? So there is this gap, this gap, this gap. That's for one subband. If you add another subband, so if n is not equal to 1, there will be um, other bands that go out here, and there will be gaps here, here. There can be many more gaps, and they can be larger and larger and larger. So uh, if we had three subbands, there could be a whole lot of gaps to, to think about here. And which one is the one that sort of jumps at you is not so obvious. So this gap can be completely the wrong gap to look at. Or it could be a convolution of several gaps, and that's why it looks so broadened. And certainly, it's not the k equals 0 gap, because it does not close. You can see the 0 bias peak emerging, and this gap is unmoved. Whereas the k equals 0 gap should become 0 and then reopen. All right. Thank you.